Welcome to session 45 of our weekly event series where we bring in experts across various disciplines in tech. What we focus on is non-technical disciplines to talk about what it's like to work in those roles, the skills that are required to be successful in them and how you could potentially leverage your experience to get these opportunities. And today the conversation is gonna be focused on breaking into partnership development in tech and we are lucky to have Aaron Kelly who's now head of partnerships at Transparent Financial Systems. I think right before that um, Aaron you were at Crunchbase and you've had a really cool career so we're excited to dig into that today and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah happy to be here thanks. Great uh, just a couple of notes here before we get started this is our agenda for the evening we're doing the introduction right now we promise We'll stop in a second so you can hear from Aaron. We'll get a quick introduction from Aaron in the beginning, and then we'll jump straight into our conversation about Aaron's career. Um, and we'll have a discussion also about some of the skills required to get into these roles, how to navigate the career, you know, how Aaron got to navigate her career as well, because I know you had some uh, interesting changes and pivots as well from where you thought you were going to be to where you are today, uh, which is the kind of stuff we love to talk about. Uh, and then we'll have more of an open Q&A at the end. But I will say, we say this every single week, the Q&A really happens throughout. Um, so we want to see your questions throughout the, the conversation. You can always drop them in the chat as we have our conversation with Aaron. Maybe you want us to dig into something a little bit deeper that we asked that maybe we didn't touch on. Maybe you have some other question that you think is going to be relevant for other people here in the group um, who want to learn more. So please do... Uh, make sure that this is an open dialogue. We catch typically almost every single question that comes in um, and we want to hear from you. And also it's a way for us to get to know each other. If this is your first time joining a School 16 event, um, we, we like to see repeat people come in and it's great to see names that we recognize. So uh, we're going to send a survey afterwards as well. I, I, hopefully you're, if you've been to all 45 events, you don't hate us for saying this every single time. But uh, we look at every single response. It's so important for us to know, you know, what value people are getting from these events. What could we do, be doing better uh, to improve on them? It takes literally 30 seconds to, to complete. So I think survey feels like a heavy word. It's not, it's super easy. Um, and we'll ask you to do so so that we can send you the recording or if you just want to be nice and, and fill it out for us, uh, we want to hear from you. And actually the prompt for the survey will pop up right after the webinar is done. So you don't even have to uh, go find the link. All right. Um, and then we'll have some announcements towards the end, but let's get started with our conversation with Aaron. And again, folks, please feel free to drop your questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, whatever it is you might think might be relevant into the chat. There's also the Q&A function that you could use uh, if you'd rather. It doesn't really matter. We'll see both. So to start off, Aaron, if you don't mind giving us maybe like a few minute overview just for some context of your background to date, and then we're going to dig into the specifics. Yeah, great. Um, thank you guys again for having me. So let's see, uh, my background is a little bit all over the place, um, but that's kind of what also works for business development and partnerships. Um, so I ended up getting into tech from um, retail and from consulting. Most of my background was in retail, in e-commerce, um, and then I worked doing consulting for those types of clients. Um, and then I realized I didn't want to be in retail anymore. I wanted to switch into something that was tech related. So I ended up at um, a company called a firm, which is buy now, pay later. Um, and I kind of made that switch because they were straddling that line of fintech, but then they also needed people who knew retail. So that was kind of my in uh, to move over there. And then after that, I was at Crunchbase, um, which is a data platform um, and sales tool. And so I did a bunch of different types of partnerships there. Um, again, it's one of those places where partnerships in BD could mean a lot of things, even in one company, our team worked on totally different things. Um, and then actually just recently, I moved over to Transparent, um, which is, again, another fintech, but it's like a blockchain crypto fintech. So again, switching industries and still doing that partnerships thread throughout. Got it. Very cool. Thank you for that quick and succinct uh, version of your background. Love it. Um, so, okay, I, I want to start off kind of in the earlier part of your career, because I know that you were an architecture uh, major in undergrad, yet somehow you found yourself on the business side of things. And I actually know that you also did the Peace Corps for, for a little while too. So, so tell me a little bit about the evolution of, of Aaron from who, who you thought you were in college to 
what ended up happening once you got into sort of the real world uh, in developing your career? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I did a, a degree in architecture in undergrad because I was that kid who loved math and also loved art. And I was like, oh, this seems like a logical thing to do to kind of put them together. Um, and it was great as far as a major, but I think what a lot of people learn is I was like, oh, this is interesting. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, it, you know, it did, a, it actually had a lot of like, you were on the computer and CAD and all these different programs. I was like, that's not that, like, that's not really what I want to do. I'm much more of a people person. Um, and I think college helped me realize that in a lot of ways. Um, so I ended up in retail working for, um, an e-commerce company called One Kings Lane when it was a small startup um, in San Francisco. Honestly, just because I was like, well, I'm a tactile visual person and retail is kind of this like tactile area, like you deal with products. I was doing, um, I was doing uh, buying. So you're working to like pick which products end up on the website. And so those two things kind of fit together. And that's the rationale that I had of like, okay, this is retail seems interesting because I'm dealing with you know, visuals and stuff. And that's kind of how I moved over there. Um, the Peace Corps, again, like I said, I've got a little bit of a mixed bag of a background. Um, I did a lot of like social justice type of work when I was um, in college, I went to Berkeley. And so all of the programs have a little bit of that bent um, and decided to, you know, leave the Bay and go do the Peace Corps just to, you know, have the opportunity to do that. I figured, you know, once I was, the age I am now, I probably wouldn't pick up my life and just go move to another continent. So it was, it was good timing to just, you know, do something for me. And, you know, the corporate world will always be there and I can always come back to it. Uh, I, I actually 100% agree with you. The corporate world will, will always be there. People are, are, I think, a little bit afraid sometimes when they start on a path, if they sort of diverge for a minute, that they'll never be able to come back. While that may be the case in some disciplines, um, it, in tech, it's actually much more fluid and you can, you can kind of hop in, hop out as needed, as long as you keep your skills somewhat sharp. But okay, so, so you, you start off in, in the world, you ended up getting into from, from the uh, retail side into consulting. And I believe you did your MBA as well, right before getting into tech, is that right? Yeah, so after I came back from the Peace Corps, I ended up um, going and doing my MBA, and that's how I ended up in management consulting. Um, mm -hmm. And then I focused on retail clients in the management consulting world. Um, so kind of continued that thread. Okay, so in hindsight, uh, do you think the MBA was useful for the stuff that you're doing now um, or, or not? To be honest, I think life experience is more useful for what I'm doing now. The, the MBA was really valuable for me just because it helped me figure out what I wanted and what I didn't and gave me, it's such a general degree, it gave me like a little bit of exposure to this, a little bit of exposure to that. Um, but I think it was also because I didn't really have, you know, I didn't have a business background. Um, I didn't, didn't hang out with kids who went to the business school in undergrad. Like it just wasn't um, the the people that I had surrounded myself with previously. And I think that's one of the things that's, that's valuable about doing any kind of school program is you're surrounding yourself with other people who are interested and knowledgeable about something. So you, you get to learn from those people. And that was a ton of the value that I got out of that. Yeah, that's, you know, I hear that a lot from folks that, that do MBAs is that the network is, is huge and important. If you don't have any kind of business background, it's kind of a good uh, way to get exposed to it, but the real hands-on skills are really learned on the job. But, you know, when you think about employer's perspective and that, that consulting job that you got, uh, do you think that probably played a role that you had the MBA that you ended up being able to land that gig? Oh yeah. I definitely got the consulting job because of my MBA because they recruit directly from the grad school. So I kind of went through that recruiting cycle while I was doing my degree. So yeah, it definitely that helped me land that job and having a consulting job helped me land my next job at a firm. Um, they definitely were markers of like, okay, someone else said you could do this. Great. We trust that you can do it. Yeah. The, 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 the marker thing, the sort of signaling um, yeah. is important. There's other ways to get those signals. Um, but I see what you mean. Do you think, did, do you think the, so I do want to talk a little bit now about your transition from, from the consulting to tech. Um, because, you know, partnerships, you ended up getting to partnerships development right away. So I'm curious, uh, 
in that process, when you can you talk a little bit about that process of trying to leave consulting and getting to tech? Did you was that very deliberate? Did you spend a lot of time applying? What did that process look like? Yeah, well, so I was very lucky for one. Um, one of the good things about consulting is when you leave consulting, you're always seen as a potential customer and future client. So they make it really easy for you to leave. So at Carney, the firm I was at, they give you a three month window where they basically don't put you on client projects. They're like, okay, here's an internal report to write, but basically you have three months off to find a job where we still pay you, which was phenomenal because that's unheard of in most industries. Um, so in that way, the transition was easy in terms of like, okay, I've got a solid amount of time. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do leaving it. It was definitely intentional leaving consulting. Um, but I, I was in San Francisco. I knew that I did want to go into tech. Um, so that's kind of where I started. But I also thought a lot about like, okay, product roles seem interesting, maybe product marketing. Um, I was sort of taking the pieces of what are the things about consulting that I do like and what other jobs can I find that have those components? So like product has a lot of strategy in it. I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Um, partnerships has a lot of that like people management and relationship stuff. Um, so I talked to a lot of people in my network, friends of friends who were at tech companies, had a lot of phone calls of, okay, you know, what is your job like? Do you think I could get a job like your job? Um, and just kind of connecting and talking with people a lot about it to figure out what was a good fit. Okay. And so what was that moment or series of, of in, in moments and, and information yeah. that you got that made you think that partnerships, you know, hey, I, there's all these roles, product marketing looks cool, product looks cool, but I'm going to go for partnerships. Was there something specific? And do you think you were just more likely to get that role uh, versus maybe a product role, which may require a little bit more product experience? Yeah. So I, one of the like key pieces of information that I gleaned from talking with people who are in product was even our beginning product roles, we try and hire people who already have five years of product experience. So product like very quickly became like, oh, this would be the most difficult to get into. Even if the list of skills in the job description, I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that, I can do that. Unless you've already done it somewhere else, it's insanely hard to get into. Um, it's, that's one of those things where oddly, if you're in an MBA program, you can get a job as a product manager without any experience. But as soon as you're like one year out of that program, doesn't matter. You have to have five years of experience, um, which is a really odd timing thing, but it, it exists. Um, so yeah, I think partnerships was kind of this, okay, I think this is what I can sort of pitch myself as the most. Like I can, you know, put together a rationale for why I would be good at partnerships based on my past experience. Um, and I think also part of it was like, what jobs did I happen to come across in those three months that sounded cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, the sounded cool thing is real. And, and yeah. a good, uh, one, one barometer, um, important barometer, especially earlier on in your career. Um, I, I am curious though, what did you learn in those conversations about what partnerships development actually means? And then we'll talk later about the reality of what it means. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I got clear answers. I got different answers from everyone I talked to, um, which is kind of the lesson at the end of the day. Um, everyone that I spoke to who was in some sort of BD or partnerships role had to explicitly explain, okay, th this is what this means in this specific context. Like with my company, it is these types of partnerships. Like this is the goal. These are the types of relationships. We do revenue. We don't do revenue. And then talking to someone else, it would be completely different. Um, so I think that was just, that was the information that I got. It's like, oh, this totally depends on the company and the industry. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and we'll dive into how those roles differ in the different companies that you've been part of. But um, you mentioned earlier when you were thinking about the different pieces of what you what was already in your background, the skills that you knew you already had and how you could apply that to partnerships development. As an example, looking back, the work that you did as a consultant and, and before that, what do you think contributed most to this acquiring those skills to be able to work in that environment, um, which is 
both a client facing environment where you're potentially putting together complicated agreements and contracts and, and navigating a lot of stakeholders, all these things. What do you think prepared you most to be successful in this role now that obviously you've been in it for a while? I think for me, it's been the, the breadth of projects and random things that I've gotten pulled onto over the years. Um, like one of the examples I gave when I was actually interviewing for consulting of like, okay, this is how I have worked with clients before. And this is why I know process and strategy was I got charged with running an RFP for the least sexy project ever, which was um, an RFP for all of the trash and recycling for all of Williams Sonoma's physical stores. So I was, you know, getting bids for recycling and trash providers for all of these stores and malls and like the least sexy thing ever. But I was able to talk about, you know, uh, like reviewing proposals, putting together decks, putting together spreadsheets and, uh, uh, you know, models to evaluate different pricing, meeting with people in person, conducting negotiations, like all of these different components that are actually things that I do in my job now. Um, so just being able to pull out those little pieces, because if I had said no to a bunch of these different projects, I never would have gotten those. And it, it's one of those things where it's like, you have to look back and be able to take the pieces. Like I never would have known at the time, that, oh yeah, this is preparing me for a job in BD. So then I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the interview processes for these types of roles, because Again, it's every company does partnerships differently, and it, it seems a little bit vague. How do you like? How do you even prepare for it to some extent? But, but do you recall, you know, when you were trying to get that foot in the door in that company, um, what kind of questions they ask and how you position yourself? Yeah, I think that a lot of what I found that people are kind of testing for in these types of roles is: do you understand our business? Because we can kind of slot you in wherever on partnerships teams if you understand like what our business does and then like who do, who do you think we partner with so when I was at a firm you know they're a, a fintech buy now pay later but they have partnerships with merchants and that's more the sales side but they have partnerships with e-commerce platforms with payment gateways with other products, other marketing. So you kind of just have to understand what are the components of the business. And that's some of the things that I think I've gotten asked in these is like, okay, who do you think we should partner with that we're not partnering with? Um, you know, where would it be valuable for us to expand into? And that's some of the, like the strategy component that's inherent in BD and partnership roles is thinking forward of, okay, it looks like you're doing this, but I think this would actually be a great opportunity for you to expand. Um, so it's just kind of like learning that lingo and what the business actually does that it helped me prepare. Interesting. That, that makes a lot of sense too, because I think oftentimes in these roles, you're working with leadership because that's, those are the people that are doing the partnership work anyways, most of the time, or at least in the beginning until the, co the company grows much further. So they want to make sure that you understand the business just like they do, if they're going to feel confident putting you in front of these people and different stakeholders. So that makes sense. What about Aaron, you know, you mentioned like negotiation, right? You had experience maybe working with different vendors, but negotiation skills, how did they test that? Was there any kind of like mock scenario that you have to talk through case studies and the like? Thankfully, no. Um, <laughs> for consulting, I had to do plenty of case studies. Um, I have had roles or the interviews where they do cases, um, but they're more presentations. So like a homework assignment of, okay, here's a scenario and we want you to, you know, these are the issues we're having with this partner and we want you to walk us through how you would solve it um, and maybe put together a deck of, you know, you're going into the quarterly review that you're going to have with this partner and I want you to put together a deck of what you would review, what questions you would ask, what data points you would hit on. Um, but that's generally just for any of the bigger companies that I interviewed at. Um, so larger firms who have you know, more built out processes are maybe gonna have that in the interview process, um, but smaller firms like both at a firm and then um, at Crunchbase, neither of them had those kinds of cases or scenarios. It's generally at the larger companies. Got it. Okay. 
So then I'd love to hear a little bit more of what the day-to-day was like in that, for, in that role at a firm um, once you joined. And I'll stop there uh, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah. I, I mean, so I think you generally get a mix and I certainly did um, at a firm and my other ones is some of partnerships is going to be kind of closer to account management. It's like, hey, we already have these existing partners. I want to introduce you to them. And then so that they know that you're the person they can go to if they have questions about stuff. Um, I want you to, you know, review the contract, make sure you know when renewal is up, if there are any financial terms, make sure you're keeping people updated. So some of it's a little bit of account management often until again, a company gets really big and then they split that out into a specific job where you're just partner managing. Um, And then some of it is, hey, this is an area where we maybe have two different partners and we want there to be five partners. So like, tell us who else is out in the market, you know, get in touch with people at those companies, build a plan to say, okay, I think that we should partner with a first, B second, and then C third, that's our preference. Like, and then you kind of go through that discovery and you know, negotiating and finding partners. So it's both a little bit of that new business and it's some of the account management. Got it, okay, makes sense. Um, we have a question here from Alfonso, which is actually something similar to what I was gonna ask. So thanks Alfonso, because uh, he, he crafted it in a better way than I would have. Uh, what, what are some of your tasks and KPIs in your current partnership role or others that you've had? Uh, is it prospecting, creating decks? Are you cold calling? Are you building out like new sales processes? Uh, so yeah, so KPIs uh, in, the cur- in the current role or maybe how, how have they even differed between the roles that you've had? So one thing about biz dev and partnerships, especially in startups, um, I don't have the experience at like a Microsoft or an Amazon, so it's probably different there, but uh, these roles tend to be light on KPIs. Um, <laughs> most of the teams that I have joined are like, hey, we're figuring this out help design the KPIs. Um, like, what do you think that we should be doing? Um, because, you know, most BD teams are less, there's less rigor in a way than sales teams because we generally don't have quotas that we have to reach. Um, so, you know, there aren't a certain number of partners that I need to sign. There aren't a certain number of calls that I need to make because often they're more strategic partnerships. So you'll spend a year working on signing and negotiating a really big partner that's much more strategic versus I'm going to sign 10 partners this year because it's going to create revenue in a certain way. Um, So KPIs are kind of light. Usually it'll be, you know, sign three top tier partners this year in whatever area you're working on Um, or, you know, grow X partnership by Y percent if there is a revenue component of it, or, you know, you might have some sort of like, make sure you renew 90% of the partners who are on whatever platform you're on. Um, but they do tend to be a lot looser than, than sales metrics. Sounds, sounds nice, actually. Uh, <laughs> coming from yeah, but if you're someone who like, if you're someone who needs, well, I'm going to get to here and then there and then there, it might not be a good fit because they're it's a little loosey goosey. You don't always know if you're doing the right thing. You don't always know, you know, is this what I'm supposed to be working on? You really have to prioritize yourself what you think is important. Perfect segue to my next question, which is how do you prioritize your time in, in a role like that? So, you know, you step into to a partnerships role where there's no clear KPIs, uh, company wants to do a lot. Probably the founders are giving you a bunch of different ideas. Um, maybe you can walk us through like one partnership you don't have to disclose any sensitive information, but yeah. one partnership that you've gotten, how, like how you actually organize your day-to-day to actually be able to execute on attaining that partnership. Yeah. Um, let's see, what's a good example? I mean, so some of it you're going to get is just, like I said, the keeping the lights on work. Um, so when I was at a firm, I joined and kind of got handed this product that they were building out and said, hey, we have a partner, we've kind of looped them in, but like we haven't really built anything. So like manage this partner and figure out what we're doing there and we wanna grow it. So can you also look at the market and like see what we're doing there? So you're, you're doing both of those at the same time. And oftentimes the prioritization is, you know, 
who do I, who's waiting for something from me? That's a lot of like what your tasks will be organized by. It's like, okay, I had a call with this partner a week ago. They're waiting on this deck. I need to send it to them. And then I need to schedule our follow-up because then there's someone else that I have a meeting with tomorrow. So I'll prep for that. And so it's a lot of who is waiting on me to interact with them. Um, and then generally the growth and strategy stuff can really only happen once you have those other components locked down. Um, so for example, my new job that I just started, priority number one is getting introduced to all the people that um, you know, the CEO and the president have been talking to over the past couple of months, but have these kind of disjointed conversations. So the first point of call is like, okay, let me get in touch with all the people and rope those in and figure out, you know, who I need to be speaking with. And then the second part is strategizing, putting in place processes, like we need a CRM, got to figure that out. Like we need to figure out who the next set of partners are going to be. Um, but those things always kind of come second to keeping people, keeping conversations going really. And um, that's, that's the biggest part of partnerships is you can't really, you know, you need to know which relationships need like constant attention and maybe which you can put on the back burner for a little while and be like, okay, we're not ready for this. I'll get back to you in a month. Um, so that's the juggling that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds interesting. Um, I mean, it really sounds like a pipeline management process, just like in sales, maybe the pipeline is a little bit more limited. You have very specific targets. Um, mm -hmm. But given that sometimes these partnerships take a year to come to fruition, um, like number one, you know, how do you, how do you make sure you are actually getting them to a close? Uh, but then as you're getting these partnerships to a close, um, how are you making sure that the company is capturing enough value from it to, from the partnerships so that you continue to have a job? Great <laughs> question. Um, well, so one thing that I have learned in partnerships, which is sometimes the most difficult thing to swallow, is that you're going to put a bunch of work into a bunch of partnerships that just aren't going to happen. And that's just sort of like a fact of life with partnerships, like even something you've spent six months working on, because there's, these partnerships are generally so tied to strategy, if a company's strategy change changes either your company or the partner that you're working on, you might just have to drop the whole thing. Um, and if you have a good manager or someone who knows like this is the point of partnerships, again, this is part of why you have looser KPIs. They're going to be like, yeah, well, you know, it didn't happen. You still have a job because you did exactly what you were supposed to be doing, which was trying to build this thing, but we shifted. So we can't blame you for not having it launched. Like, it sucks for you personally because you're like, oh, I really wanted that to happen. Um, but it generally doesn't put your job in jeopardy by any means. Um, but it is, that's why, I mean, it, partnerships does have similar to sales, a celebration of like when deals launch and big things happen. Um, a really important thing on the partnership side, just for the like, career management is making sure that execs and higher ups see that value when it does close. It's like, hey, this is, the implication of this partnership. This is how long we've been working on it. This is, these are all of the different cross-functional groups who have put input into it. Um, and that also really helps because a lot of times partnerships do, you know, they'll touch product and they'll touch marketing and other groups. And you'll have other people who are help, who help support the project too. So it's not just riding on your shoulders. Got it. Uh, actually, I think that's good advice for a lot of different roles is, is, making yourself noticed and the output of your work noticed. Do you have any mm -hmm. kind of advice on tactics of how to do that in a tactful way that um, is appreciated by the executives? I mean, I think one of the most helpful things is not even like there is definitely the going straight to the top of, you know, I want to make sure that my CEO knows my name and knows that this is my project. But a lot of that is actually accomplished via like the lateral relationships you have um, because you know I want the engineering manager to be like oh yes I like working with Aaron on this because then their boss knows that and then my name is known maybe like a level up amongst that cross-functional so you want like you want to be the person who is well known in your group by other groups because that helps elevate you and puts you into more conversations um, higher up. 
so I would say, you know, be helpful to the other people who aren't just on your team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, you're absolutely right. That's super important. Um, okay, so I'm curious then, I'm, I'm curious a little bit more about how these teams are structured. I know you're in a, in a startup now. Crunchbase is, was a little bit more than just a startup. They've been around for some mm -hmm. time. Were you like the only partnerships person at the team on Crunchbase? Do you have people reporting to you? Were you reporting to a bunch of people? How did that work? So, I mean, Crunchbase specifically had a pretty big partnerships team for its size, just because the business model is really partnership driven. Um, you have people who are working on data partnerships and getting data from other sources. You have people who are working on partnerships that are kind of marketing oriented that push it out. Um, so there were, when I started, maybe five of us, which for a company of 150 people is a pretty big partnerships team. Um, and now I think they've added three more people. Um, but partnerships orgs, and it was like this at a firm, it's like this at a lot of places, they're really flat. Um, so they're, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's really nice because you have generally have a lot of people who are at a similar level and everyone's working with each other collaboratively, although on slightly different streams. Um, so it's really nice that you have people to work with in that respect. It's a little bit, it can be limiting in terms of career growth because, you know, if everyone is at a manager level, it's sort of hard to nest people and have people report into other people. Um, so you can kind of create some tension there if you're trying to, to create levels and give people opportunities for growth. Um, but I would say most of them are pretty, pretty flat. Like we all, five or six of us reported up into one, well, into our, our CRO. Um, so that's, it's often what you'll get. Got it. Okay. Um, and it, and it does make sense, but then talk, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the five, six people on the team, did they all have similar backgrounds to you? Were there some like people with surprisingly different backgrounds that were able to land those roles? Cause that, you know, one of the things that, and you know, most, many of the folks that come to our events are people that are transitioning careers. You know, they, they're trying to figure out how do I make my resume work for this like cool thing that I want, maybe partnerships. So any, any, any examples of that that you've seen where people had maybe non-traditional backgrounds or didn't come from an MBA or, or something like that, that they were able to land those types of roles? Yeah. Um, well, so only one other person on my team had an MBA, um, but she actually was in partnerships pre her MBA and she started at Dropbox in recruiting and then moved from a recruiting role to the partnerships team. And this was because she was really helpful as a recruiter to those teams and someone from one of those teams is like hey you're really smart I want you on my actual team instead and pulled her over so she was able to move laterally um, someone else on the team he was previously in a like a data management data analytics role at Crunchbase and then he moved over to partnerships um, because it was kind of like hey we need to do data partnerships and he already knew the data side and was able to kind of do that move internally as well. Um, and then the other couple of people on the team had like pretty strictly, like they were doing partnerships roles for a long time, but neither of them had MBAs. So it's definitely not a prerequisite by any means. Okay, cool. So, you know, if you were, if you all of a sudden were super busy, I'm sure you're busy, but if, if you all of a sudden were even more busy, and you needed to hire somebody in the next month, um, what kind of experiences do you think would stand out to you that you would say, I know that this person will be immediately productive or would require minimal training, even though maybe they haven't been in partnerships before, what kind of things would stand out for you? I mean, I really value anything that has account management. Like, okay, you have managed someone's expectations and that is super valuable um, because it's, you know, I don't care that you haven't been in a partnerships role specifically, but like you've owned an account of some kind, you've, you know, tracked progress and, you know, made sure you have touch points with people. Um, so that can be a ton of different things. Um, I, I also, and this is one of the things, especially coming in at younger companies is really valuable is people who have processes and who can speak about processes that they have because most younger tech companies don't have any of it. There's like people have just been winging it and trying to get things done and there isn't as much structure. And generally as companies are growing, they're trying to find structure. So at earlier stages, 
people who can say, okay, this is the structure that I apply and the framework that I use, super valuable. Um, Cause you're like, great, you can do something, run with it and give me visibility. That's what I want. So I wanna talk about what you mentioned earlier, which is oftentimes in these roles, you're kind of a prerequisite and that's what they're testing for in the interview process is, do you understand our business? And you just got into a new role, completely different sector, blockchain. And, and earlier, before we started, we were talking about how this is something you have to wrap your mind around now. So how did you do that? How did you prove to you know these hiring managers that you would be able to learn this pretty quickly? I don't know how much research you did before going to the interview. I'm assuming quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and even now that you're in the role, how are you making sure that you are getting up to speed so that when you're actually executing on some of this partnerships work, you're seen as a domain expert. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of it is language is just like, I don't need to understand how an API works. I still don't, but I need to know what it is. And I need to know the, like the words someone is going to use to describe it and to say what it accomplishes. Like I need to understand just how to kind of parrot things back in a way. So in terms of, you know, moving over to blockchain and this specific company, it's like, I'm watching all the videos that they have on the demos of their product. I'm reading everything so that I can basically give them the 10 second pitch back. Cause you're going to get asked and I've gotten asked in pretty much every single interview is like, okay, so can you explain to me what our, what our product does? Um, and sometimes like I had an interview, one of my interviewees, interviewers, when I was at a firm was like, okay, explain our product to me. Like I'm a 12 year old, um, you know? And so it's, it's just being able to honestly parrot it back. Like, I don't think that in interviews, there's a ton of depth that's expected. It's more just demonstrating that I did my homework and I can understand what you're saying. And it's also this willingness to learn. Um, I actually, in one of my firm interviews, it was the head of partner engineering was interviewing me and he asked me, it's like, okay, you don't have any technical experience. What happens when you go to a website? And I just sat there and was like, I don't know. I honestly could not tell you I would be lying. But like, these are the sm small things that I do know and I understand in the background. So it's like, you can't fake it because if you're talking to a technical person, you know, you're faking it. Um, but it's demonstrating that like, I'm interested in this. I have done research on this other part. I can totally do research on what you're talking about as well. Um, so it's just being able to speak to it, even if it's not at depth. Um, another thing that is helpful and that I always do and that I did for this role is any friends that I have who work in these areas, like I am calling you, I am texting you, I'm saying, hey, what website should I go to? Like, what should I read? Like, I'm interviewing with three regulatory lawyers tomorrow. What banking regulation should I know? Um, and so it's things like that where it's like, I just don't want to get caught off guard, but utilizing people in your network, even if they're not doing exactly the right thing, like they'll be able to help explain at least basic concepts to you. Got it. Uh, I love that. Uh, basically just immersing yourself so that you have enough intelligence to be able to talk about it. Um, since you just went through this interview process, I, in so much, insofar as you can talk about it, I'd, I'd love to hear a little more about um, either the kind of questions you were asked or the kind of stories you chose to tell about yourself and your previous experiences that you think uh, clinched the, the role for you. Um, I mean, I think I got asked a lot of like, can you give me an example of a project and like how you do how you do your job, basically. Um, the company that I just joined, I'm the first business hire that's not the CEO. So everyone I was interviewing with um, was either an engineer or a lawyer. And so a lot of it is doing kind of this of what is partnerships exactly? Like what is business, what are you gonna be doing if we hire you? And so it's giving them an example with their own business of like, okay, this is how I understand your business. So this is how partnerships fits in. This is what I would be doing. This is how I would do it. Um, and again, that process component, I find helpful to explain to people of like, this is how we break down business development. Like this would be the stages. This is the first thing I'm gonna focus on. This is the second one. Um, and then using 
examples of past partners and past partnerships um, that I've worked on. And I think this is something you can do, again, not having partnerships experience. It's like you frame, okay, this is a project that I worked on and you frame it in terms of like a project management type of process. And you use that to say like, this is a process I would apply to this scenario. Um, uh, just a quick reminder to folks, if you have questions, we have another 10 minutes or so left, so feel free to drop them into the chat or the Q&A tool here in Zoom webinars. But I have a pretty specific question, mm -hmm. and that is, it's going to be comparing uh, sales to partnership development a little bit, but, you know, I've gone through, I, so I started off in sales when I got into tech, and one of the things, I think one of the benefits was, even though, uh, you know, I'm pretty social, like talking to people, I always saw myself as someone that would be in a client-facing role when I got my first job in sales. I was like, I was super nervous. I was messing up pitches. I didn't really understand how to structure deals. All the stuff that fortunately the company I was in trained me on. Um, for partnerships development work, I mean, obviously those soft skills are really important. And you mentioned earlier, the person you worked with that came from a data background and all of a sudden they put him, him or her into, in an, into a, a partnerships role. How do you learn some of those softer skills? How to behave in these meetings with stakeholders where you're trying to create compelling reasons for them to move forward, how to move it to a close, how to create pain uh, when doing the needs analysis is stuff that I learned in sales. You know, if you don't get that specific training, since it's not an actual sales role where you have a quota, how do you get those skills? Oof. Um, trial and error. I mean, I think partnerships is like sales in a lot of ways where you'll go into a meeting thinking that you're prepared and then get a bunch of different questions or like, oh, I didn't think about that at all. Shit. And like <laughs> you go through that where like you're going to reach out to people and have partner like partnerships that don't go anywhere. And then you'll look back six months later and be like, I see why that didn't work. Um, and I think it's some of that trial by fire. I think sales roles are actually really good preparation for that. Um, I, when I was at Crunchbase, basically stepped in and helped out our sales team and pitched a bunch of deals with them. And I sucked at first. And then, you know, after you do 50 of those meetings, you, you get your groove down, you get your pitch down. Um, so a lot of it is gonna be that that trial and error. I think it's also really helpful, honestly, when you start a new job is shadowing people. Um, so sitting in with other partnerships people, but also salespeople really, and just listening to like, how do they pitch the company? Like, how do they describe the product? Um, things like that and gleaning information from them. Um, because honestly, you're not going to get a lot of training in partnerships. There isn't... It, a lot bigger companies kind of expect you to already have the skills and smaller companies don't have those resources built out. Um, to be honest, I've used a lot of like the sales resources because sales teams generally have more enablement um, and resources. So borrowing those is a good way to kind of get up to speed. That's smart. Well, at least it sounds like also you're, you're given room to fail uh, and it's okay yeah. at the very least that trial and error piece, which I think in maybe different roles, there's, there's less flexibility for that. Yeah. I mean, that's also part of the, you know, not having a quota, um, you know, it's not, if this one partnership doesn't work out, uh, you know, my paycheck isn't impacted. Mm, yeah, totally agreed. So you mentioned how, you know, you shadowed these sales teams. It sounds like if you have sales experience, it should be a natural fit for partnerships roles, account yeah. management as well. Do you have a specific example of maybe someone that came from a direct sales role and got into partnerships? Story? Um, trying to think. Um, yeah, I mean, at a firm, I definitely saw it where people were in directly sales roles. Um, and then a couple people had come over to the partnerships side of things. Um, to be honest, the biggest difference between so the sales generally and partnerships is partnerships is always going to be B2B versus sales is often B2C. Um, but they're really similar skill sets. It's just that uh, partnerships requires people to be a little bit more long-term and strategic. Um, but, and you'll see that on sales teams, like some people are super effective, but only really short-term driven. And some people just kind of naturally are able to draw those relationships out and think bigger picture. Um, so there's definitely a type of salesperson who's 
not even remotely interested in partnerships and there's a type that it makes sense to kind of move them over um you'll often see people who are you know coming in in SDR roles like just getting their kind of break in um role and then at least like looking to the BD team is okay do I want to be an AE or do I want to move over to partnerships um and kind of thinking of that as like a step to graduate to um it's definitely again it's a harder role to come into fresh without any tech experience but it's definitely a role that you can come into from other areas within the company yeah it's i agree 100% definitely not your first job out of college but having some kind of stepping stone experience for you as consulting it sounds like maybe it could be obviously account management sales other functions you mentioned process oriented work there's a lot of ops jobs that involve that as well if you've rolled out processes you established crms for startups all that stuff super relevant that makes yep. sense. Um, and one thing I want to touch on, I think that was really important that you mentioned is knowing your personality type, because if you are that type of person that needs constant positive feedback loop, you actually could do really well in sales in a more transactional role where you're mm -hmm. closing deals every week. If it's going to be painful for you to have to wait a year to see if something materializes, maybe partnership development is it for you or yeah. you need to find a company where there is a partnership quota, where they need X amount of partners every month. And that's the type of work that you do. Yep. Totally. You know, and, and this is, Vadim already kind of asked this question around people coming from a sales background, which Raphael asked, but you know, one thing I think that's challenging for people coming out of sales is there's so many different types of sales roles out there that there's like sometimes a little bit of a stigma and assumptions about like who you might be mm -hmm. if you come from a sales background. And I'm wondering how someone might um, overcome any kind of stigma that may be associated with being like a career salesperson to then be able to come into a partnerships role? How do you think they might be able to successfully make a case for themselves and, and make themselves stand apart from a sea of other salespeople that might be trying to get into a partnerships role? Yeah. I mean, I think it's hard to get past just like if it's a resume review type of stuff like that's difficult because sales is so metrics driven that like you're going you want to put, you know, I exceeded quota on this and that. But it's really emphasizing like the relationship stuff. So especially when you're in, in an interview or having a conversation, it's emphasizing like, how did you build the relationship with this prospect? Like, how did you, even if it's like do research to understand their business? Like I, cause a big part of partnerships is understanding what the other party's priorities are so that you can figure something out that makes both people happy. So it's less like, you know, I'm a smooth talker and I was able to close X number of deals. It's, you know, I wanted to understand their business. I really thought about what market we should go into. So it's just taking the day-to-day -day things and like looking a little bigger picture when you talk about it. So like when you talk about how you grew your book of business, talk about, you know, the macro trends of, oh, I saw that we, you know, we were doing really well in this area. I thought our product could work really well actually in this other industry. So that's where I tried to grow my book of business and understand how they needed us. It's kind of that, like those strategic understanding things that maybe underpin the work you've been doing in sales. It's just a matter of how you talk about it. Love that. Thank you for that. That's so helpful. And I, the way you summed it up in the end, it is just a matter of how you talk about it and you want to be somewhat selective about how you present that experience. There's a lot of ways you can frame it. I think yep. the way that you just mentioned is super, super helpful. Thank you. So my last question for you, uh, Aaron, in the last few minutes here, you talked about earlier how sometimes because partnerships is one of these roles that you work with a lot of lateral departments, but there's not really a ton of management or any management structure for that matter. You, get, you report yeah. directly to the CRO. Um, thinking about upward mobility from this role. So, I mean, you've been in a couple of partnerships roles now. You're in a completely different sector. Um, and it sounds like it's in a really exciting company. How are you thinking about next five plus years for yourself? I'm not like a big five-year plan type person, but forward kind of trajectory for someone that has experience or partnerships or maybe other people that you've, whose careers you've followed who started off in the similar discipline and what that could lead to. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, moving to this new role is part of that longer term trajectory because a lot of what you're if you want to move up in partnerships you either have to kind of wait around and hope that the company that you're at grows big enough that they're going to need to put levels in 
you know, that they're going to need a whole team of people working on this and that you can kind of run that team of a couple of people. Um, so that's one strategy. And that's especially if you're more comfortable at larger companies. Um, for me, you know, I didn't want to wait around that long. Um, so it was moving to a company that's earlier stage that, you know, I'm the first partnerships person. So I get to build out that team. Um, what that means later down the line, like if you're looking to do, to get into like a C-suite role, again, I mentioned like, um, you know, chief revenue officer, chief commercial officer, you can kind of come at that from like a sales side, you can come at it from a partnership side. Um, there's a couple of different ways from more of like a customer success side. Um, but I think you generally will end up managing those three types of things under revenue. It's like anything that touches revenue, whether it's long-term strategically in partnerships, shorter term in sales, or customer success and renewals, those kind of all roll up into this revenue thread. So that's maybe maybe where I'll end up. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll have, we'll have, or you'll be the CEO in a couple of years. That's, that's the beauty of being in a startup. Oh, that sounds really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> but CRO is. sounds stressful. Too. <laughs> uh, well, head of partnerships is also a really cool title. So congratulations thank on you. the new role. And also, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today so soon after just getting your new role and ramping up and you know, fresh, diving you know? deep. So, yeah, exactly. Which is great because you were able to give us such a fresh perspective as well. I really appreciate I learned a lot actually here today. You, you demystified a lot about some of the assumptions that I had about uh, what partnerships meant. So we really appreciate your time here. And thank you for sharing those insights, Aaron. It was really great to hear from Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, of course. No, no problem. Just a few announcements for folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to drop the survey link right into the chat here. If you can provide your feedback on today's session. Again, we read all of those obsessively. So we always appreciate your feedback. Not obsessively, but we love seeing that feedback. Um, also, if you want to hear about future events, you can follow us on Instagram at school 16 co or on LinkedIn, just type in school 16. We show up as a school there. And of course we post about all our events there. And then last but not least, join us next Wednesday with a product lead, Chloe, she product lead at TikTok. And I think she was at Facebook before that. So she went the product route, but also actually started off uh, working in various BD roles. So if you go back in her LinkedIn and you see all the different responsibilities she's had, it sounds like maybe when she was weighing the different options there and she ended up going the product route. But a lot of that, this is again, the beauty of tech. You can make these lateral moves. You can you know, make a decision that I want my core responsibilities to be something else and then make that transition. Because at the end of the day, to your point, Aaron, they're looking for smart people that they are confident they can put in front of other smart people that they can then communicate the value of the business, the product, whatever it is that they're doing to get to whatever that next milestone is, whether that's a product milestone or obviously in these cases, some kind of business goal that they're trying to reach. So folks, thanks so much for joining us. Aaron, thanks so much for all the insight and we'll see everybody next week. Great. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye everybody.